from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the following is provided by the West Virginia Department of Education and West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hey! Hey everyone, it's Education Station, the show where we invite teachers from all across West Virginia to submit videos of themselves teaching their favorite lessons. In today's episode, we've got three exciting lessons about science and reading. Well, hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Alex Milanese, and we're kicking off today's episode with an exciting science lesson. Now, one of my favorite Disney movies is The Lion King, and in it, they talk about the circle of life. Well, that's kind of an example of something called life cycles. For more on this, let's go visit Mr. Shrewsbury. Hi, my name is Caleb Shrewsbury. I'm a junior at Bluefield High School, and I attend the Mercer County Tech. Center. Today we'll be discussing life cycles by reading a book called Harold and Grace. A lonely leaf grew from a tiny tree beside a little pond. Some silky eggs were stuck to the underside of this lonely leaf, which hung just a pebble splash above some slimy eggs in the little pond. Then the storm hit. The storm rushed and howled and splashed and blew at the tiny tree, the little pond, and the lonely leaf. When it finally stopped, the lonely leaf was safe. But the storm had stolen all except one of the silky eggs and all but one of the slimy eggs. The silky egg and the slimy egg hatched at the same time on the same day. Hello, said Harold the tadpole. Hello, said Grace the caterpillar. Harold swam off to explore the little pond. There he overheard some gossiping guppies. Is that a fish? Where are its fins? It can't be much of a fish without any fins. It was very sad. Swim for Harold. Grace slithered up to the side of the tiny tree. Some snooty stick bugs crossed her path. Oh my god, what a ghastly shade of green. And would you look at that ridiculous fur? It was very a very sad slither for Grace. Wherever Harold and Grace ventured in the little pond or on the tiny tree, they were always teased for being different. One day, Harold and Grace met back at the Lonely Leaf. I like your fur, said Harold. I like your tail, said Grace. And the two became best friends that day. As time went on, Harold and Grace grew bigger, and Harold star started to change. The fish in the pond noticed the changes. Look at those fins. They look strong. Want to go for a swim with us? Harold was excited that he'd made some new friends. He spent more and more time swimming with the fish in the pond. and less and less time with Grace at the Lonely Leaf. Harold's changes didn't stop. As he got bigger, his tail began to shrink. The fish in the pond noticed that change too. Ew, what happened to your tail? What kind of freak fish has legs? Harold's new friends were acting, aren't, weren't acting like friends anymore. Harold returned to the Lonely Leaf looking for Grace, but she was nowhere to be seen. All Harold could find was a small silky sack sitting where his old friend once slept. Harold sat near the Lonely Leaf every day. Every night he fell asleep with his head resting on the small silky stack. I'm so sorry, Grace, Harold croaked. I miss you so much. One morning, Harold awoke to a wiggly feeling beneath his sleepy head. When Harold opened his eyes, he saw something fluttering in the dim morning light. Harold shot out his long tongue to grab the tasty morsel from the air, but as he pulled the butterfly into his mouth, Harold, it called his name, Harold. Harold was not used to his breakfast talking to him. Harold, you big green nink and poop, it's me. He quickly, he quickly spat out the butterfly. Hello, Harold, said Grace with a shaky, sticky smile. Hello, Grace, said Harold with an embarrassed grin. Harold couldn't believe the small silky stack had been hiding his best friend all along. 
and he really couldn't believe he'd almost eaten her for breakfast. Grace had become a beautiful butterfly and Harold had become a fantastic frog. Harold could hop and Grace could fly. They didn't need to stay near the little pond and tiny tree anymore. They went adventuring and soon discovered others who were just like them. But no matter how many new friends they found, Harold and Grace never forgot the special one they had made so long ago, near a lonely leaf growing from a tiny tree beside a small pond. Love you, Barry. In the book, Harold and Grace, we're going to talk about life cycles. A life cycle uh, is a series of stages that an animal goes through during its life. All living things go through life cycles. Life cycles can have many stages and life cycles go on forever. So now that we know about life cycles, we're going to talk about the life cycle of a frog. A frog has four stages in its life cycle, and the first stage being eggs, which are a slimy, clumpy thing you find in a pond, usually in the water, but sometimes also on land. Then stage two is a tadpole, which is a fish-like worm creature that has no arms or legs. Then a froglet is a tadpole, which has grew arms and legs, which would be stage three. And then stage four would be an adult frog when the tail falls off of the froglet. Now that we learned about the lifestyle of a frog, let's have a quick review before we move on. So, which stage would the tadpole go in? If you stayed stage two, you'd be correct. Which stage would the adult frog be put in? If you said stage four, you'd be correct. Which stage would the froglet go in? If you said stage three, you'd be correct. Which stage would the eggs go in? If you said stage one, you'd be correct. Now that we've re reviewed the frog life cycle, let's review another animal. So, this animal would be a butterfly. Stage one, you would have eggs, which are silky clumps that are usually on the underside of a leaf. After the eggs hatch, they hatch a larva called a caterpillar, which eats until it goes into hibernation into a cocoon, and then it goes into a butterfly. Now that we reviewed the life cycle of two different creatures, let's have a review of both. So a frog is the adult version of which of these two, a caterpillar or a tadpole? If you said tadpole, you'd be correct. And a butterfly is the adult version of which one? Tadpole or caterpillar? If you said caterpillar, you'd be correct. Hope you enjoyed my lesson about life cycles and I encourage you to explore more about life cycles of other creatures. Thanks, Mr. Shrewsbury. Okay, next up, we have an awesome read aloud story. Miss Chapman is going to share a story called Growing Up Vegetable Soup. Let's check it out. Hi, I'm Christy Chapman and I'm the Special Education Coordinator here at Nicholas County Schools. And today I'm going to read to you Growing Vegetable Soup and it's written and illustrated by Lois Ellert. Um, I picked this book because we're all getting ready to plant our gardens and this is all about planting gardens and how they grow and what you can do with them after they are ready to harvest. So looking forward to reading it to you. Growing Vegetable Soup, written and illustrated by Lois Ellert. Growing Vegetable Soup. Dad says we are going to grow vegetable soup. We are ready to work and our tools are ready too. They have a rake, a shovel, and a hoe. I like this book because it labels everything so you'll have to look for the labels on all the things. We are planting the seeds. Here's a seed package and you have to dig a hole, and then here are all the different seeds they're planting. Green bean seeds, pea seeds, corn seeds, zucchini squash, and carrot seeds. And a garden glove if you don't want to get your hands dirty. And all the sprouts. Oh, look at all the sprouts they have. Here are potato eyes, so when you plant potatoes, they have to have little eyes so they'll grow. A tomato plant, onions, a pepper plant, cabbage, and broccoli. This is called a trowel. It's like a little mini shovel and giving them water. So here are all the seeds that they're watering. Lots of things there. And waiting for the warm sun to make them grow. 
get all the things growing. Oh, there's a weed. They'll have to pick that one later. And grow. It's interesting to watch how plants grow because they start changing and getting lots of things. Some grow taller, some grow on the ground, some grow underground. And grow into plants. So here they are ready to harvest. This is a pea plant and it needs a stake and a net so that the peas can grow on it and they're easy to pick. Here's the soil or the dirt. Zucchini squash growing and these are the blossoms on the squash, the flowers. We watch over them and weed. So weed means to pull out things that don't need to be there so everything else can grow. And even sometimes you get a worm. You need to pick those off too so they doesn't eat too much. This is called a hand grubber. I sometimes just call that a mini rake. Until the vegetables are ready for us to pick. So they have tomatoes and peppers they're picking and corn and they're putting them in a basket or dig up. So some things grow underground like carrots and potatoes. We call this a spading fork. It's like a little fork that you can put down on the ground and, and pick up your stuff and carry them home. Then we wash them. Here they have a head of cabbage and an onion. And cut them and put them in a pot of water. So they have their soup pot and a ladle. That's like a big spoon they can get the liquid out of, a knife, and all the things they're going to put into their soup. Listen to what they're going to put in there, and you give your teacher a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you think you'd like that in your vegetable soup. So there's broccoli, cabbage, green beans, potatoes, peppers, peas, tomatoes, zucchini squash, onion, corn, and carrots. Mm, I think I would give a thumbs up to all those things. And cook them into vegetable soup. And this white stuff is supposed to be steam, so when you're cooking something on the stove and that steam is coming off, oh, it smells so delicious. At last, it's time to eat it all up. It was the best soup ever. There's their soup bowl and soup spoon. I think anything that you grow yourself makes, makes things delicious. And also what I like about that one that says, and we can grow it again next year. But on the back of this book, it has a recipe to make your own vegetable soup and it tells you how to do it. So check out this recipe and make some vegetable soup of your own. Thanks, Ms. Chapman. You know, one of my favorite parts about living in Appalachia is watching the leaves change color in the fall. But have you ever wondered why leaves change color? Well, to answer this question, let's send it over to Miss Sinisi. Today's video is on why do leaves change color in the fall? It's kind of a, a topical thing since the leaves are getting ready to change color here. It's the middle of October. Um, leaves are green in the spring and in the summer because they are making lots of chlorophyll. And I put a little asterisk here so we can figure out what chlorophyll is in case you don't know. Chlorophyll is the substance that gives plants their green color. It's a pigment. It's found within the leaves. It's actually found within the thylakoid membranes of the leaves. It helps plants absorb energy and get nutrients from the sunlight during photosynthesis. We're going to look at the process of photosynthesis very briefly, but if we break down the word, we can break it into photo, which means light, right? And synthesis is to make. So they're making food using sunlight. That's what plants do, and chlorophyll is the pigment that helps them do this. This is where this process takes place. So we have water, and we have carbon dioxide out in the atmosphere, and then the sunlight comes in. These are called the reactants, and the product that we get is glucose, which is a simple sugar, and oxygen, which we breathe out. So the plants can use the carbon dioxide, which we exhale, to make sugar and water with the help of sunlight. And that's what chlorophyll does. It helps with photosynthesis. 
all of the sunlight in the spring and in the summer trigger those leaves to keep making chlorophyll because the more chlorophyll they have, the more they can photosynthesize. So we have long hours of sunlight, long hours of daylight, and all of that sunlight is driving that process of photosynthesis. Um, trees are very sensitive to changes in the environment, changes in sunlight, changes in water, changes in pH. So summer begins to fade, and as a result, the hours of daylight get shorter. We have less sunlight. Right now, it used to be getting dark at 9 o'clock. Now it's getting dark at like 7, 7.15, and it'll go clear back to 5 o'clock. As those days get shorter, and there's a shorter amount of light, that's going to give a, a little signal or trigger to our leaves. And then that tells those leaves, stop producing chlorophyll. Because now we don't have as much sunlight, we don't need to photosynthesize, so stop producing chlorophyll. As that chlorophyll starts to break down, that green color is going to disappear in the leaves. And as it disappears, we get yellow and orange colors that will become visible. These are called accessory pigments. And an accessory is like if you had a handbag or a purse that goes with your outfit, something that goes with something. They're accessory to chlorophyll. They're also pigments, but they're kind of secondhand pigments. Um, at the same time, we have other chemical changes that could occur. They would give us red color, and that red is called an anthocyanin. Uh, cyanin means blue, antho means red, right? Anthocyanin pigments. So here's some examples I gave you of trees you might see around here. Dogwoods and sumacs, they kind of have reddish and purple leaves when they change. Sugar maple is a brilliant orange, and oaks are mostly browns, sort of a muted color. So different trees produce different types of accessory pigments. But what affects the color? The amount of red and the time that the leaf's color is displayed is directly dependent on these two things, moisture and temperature. So moisture, the amount of rainfall, temperature, whatever it is outside, 50, 60, 70, 80 degrees, these processes control the pigments because they are present both before and during the time that the chlorophyll amounts begin to decrease. So those two are present all the time, the amount of moisture and the temperature. The best fall foliage displays come after warm, sunny days and cool but not freezing nights. That process of freezing changes our, our plants a little bit. We don't want it to freeze, we just want it to be cool. Sunshine promotes the creation of sugar in leaves, that glucose, that C6H12O6. So the more sun we have, the more sugar we have, and the more glucose we have. Large amounts of sugar and light result in the creation of that anthocyanin pigment, that red pigment. So it has a lot of, has a lot of uh, red in it. And what happens is those veins in leaves, and we're going to do a video about the, you know, the anatomy of a leaf, but those little veins that you see when you look at a leaf kind of look like your veins. They narrow during the fall, and this guarantees that the sugars produced during the day remain trapped in the leaves. So those little veins, instead of moving the sugars through the leaves, narrow and trap those, that sugar in the leaves. And what we have what are called carotenoid pigments. If you see, you kind of see the word carrot. These are orange. Even a pumpkin has carotenoids. A squash has carotenoids. They're always present in the leaves, but the yellow and the gold colors are less influenced by the weather. Red is more influenced by the weather. Yellow and gold, a little bit less so. And then they have what's called in carotenoid pigments, beta carotene. Do you remember when you were little and your mom said, eat a lot of carrots, you can see better at night? That's really true. Beta carotene is made up of rhodopsin molecules when it breaks down, and that's very important in sight and your vision. But that strongly absorbs the blue-green light, and it reflects back that red and yellow and gives that leaves that bright orange color that you see. We also have what are called flavanols or flavonoid proteins. They're always in the leaves, but they aren't seen because of the chlorophyll. So once the chlorophyll breaks down, then they can produce that yellow and we can see the yellow. We have this moisture in the soil and it must remain adequate throughout the year in order to see the beautiful fall foliage. If we have a drought conditions, we don't have enough rain, we won't be able to see the beautiful fall foliage that we usually see. It will delay the colors and then sometimes the trees will just go directly to brown the leaves and fall off. We have these warm temperatures in the fall um, where they will lower the intensity of the fall colors a little bit like we have now and they will trigger leaf drops because the colors can't change. Um, the best foliage, like I said, was warm, wet spring, followed by a calm summer weather and sunny fall days with cooler nights. This is when we would see the best colors. 
other changes. We're looking at the point where the stem of the leaf is attached and I kind of drew some leaves here and all leaves have a little stem where you pull them off. Where it's attached here to the branch of the tree, there's a special little layer of cells that develop right there. And as that um, change happens and chlorophyll isn't being produced and the sugar is being halted in the veins of the leaf, then this starts to break down here. And what's happened, we're gradually going to sever those tissues that support that leaf on that stem, on that branch. And at the same time, what the tree will do is seal that over. Sort of like when you have a cut and then you get a scab, that the tree sort of makes a scab. And so it seals that over so that when the leaf is finally blown off by the wind or it falls to the ground by its own weight, it's kind of heavy and it's going to fall, it leaves behind what's called a leaf scar, like a little place on the branch where you could tell there was a leaf there. Only some trees lose their leaves. Right here, we've talked about living in a temperate deciduous forest. Deciduous trees lose their leaves. But we have conifers, pine trees, pine, spruce, fir, hemlock, cedar. Those are evergreen, meaning they're green all year round. They produce needles instead of leaves, and we have that green color all year round. What I wanted to do is, as I was researching this, I wanted to take a closer look at chlorophyll because chlorophyll is a really remarkable thing and remarkable processes that occur. But not only does a tree use chlorophyll, humans can use chlorophyll. Do you photosynthesize? No. But we'll see what, what, can, what can chlorophyll do for us as humans? Um, how does that help us? There are certain things. Chlorophyll can boost your energy. It can help heal wounds. It can fight certain illnesses. It's a natural source of antioxidants, which we'll look at here in a minute. It manages some skin conditions, and it can prevent certain types of cancers. So chlorophyll is a really remarkable, um, is a remarkable molecule. We can apply it what's called topically. That's when you rub it on your skin. That's a topical, because you're on top of your skin, application. So we have healthcare providers, and they can prescribe a medication that has chlorophyll in it. It's known as chlorophyllin and it will help to promote the healing in those wounds. And it reduces some of the odors associated with open wounds. Um, it has been used to reduce acne. Um, it has a potential anti-aging remedy that helps to reduce the signs of photo-aging. Again, light or sun. You know, you have a lot of sun exposure and it ages your skin faster. And if you take or put this chlorophyll, chlorophyllin on, it can help reduce some of those signs of, of that um, sun exposure. We can also take it internally, which right, you eat it or you swallow it. It's chemically similar to hemoglobin. And hemo, right, means red. We're looking at hemoglobin is that pigment or that protein component of red blood cells that carries oxygen. So we have that oxygen and then this oxygen binds to those carriers in your body. So you have all that oxygen. If you've ever heard of someone dying of carbon monoxide poisoning, what happened was that carbon wants to be carbon dioxide, two oxygens instead of one, but it's floating around in there with one oxygen, so it's looking for others. And so what it does is it binds to your red blood cells to steal that oxygen from hemoglobin and you suffocate from the inside out essentially. Right? So potential beneficial for improving anemia related symptoms, low blood, right? Low red blood cells, um, fatigue, low energy, dizziness, those are all anemia related. Liquid chlorophyll is a potential blood builder because of the potential to increase that red blood cell count and improve the quality of red blood cells. It, it enhances your red blood cells. It's also shown to enhance the liver's ability to remove toxins and waste. That's what your liver does. Your liver gets rid of toxins and wastes in your body and um, chlorophyll can help with that. Um, and derivatives of chlorophyll may help prevent and slow cancer growth. And, the re and how you get that is you have to consume it in a diet, in your diet, you have to have rich in greens, leafy vegetables, spinach, chard, we'll look a little bit in these other things, particularly cancer of the liver, the bladder, and the pancreas. And if you notice, these are all things that are removing toxins from our body, removing, you know, uh, bad things. Here's our summary. The summary of the things that chlorophyll can do, it can aid in weight loss because it helps the thyroid gland maintain your healthy metabolism. It's also been shown to balance hormones that prompt us to eat when we feel full, like ghrelin. Ghrelin is one of those hormones. When you, you're eating, 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 and you feel full and you're like, oh, I should stop eating. What chlorophyll would do was to 
make that hormone appear so that you've taken it and you, you feel full even though you haven't eaten. So it helps to promote weight loss. We've talked a little bit, it controls body odor. We can ingest it, which means you take it orally, and the detoxification in the liver, and it makes that digestion more efficient. It encourages healing because it inhibits bacterial growth and reduces infection from those wounds. It's a natural detoxifier. It contains something called A flaotoxin B1. That's a big word, but that helps to reduce the damage to your DNA from toxins. When we talk about antioxidants, there are processes that occur in your body. Reduction, oxidation. Reduction, we're gaining electrons. Oxidation, we're losing electrons. If something's an antioxidant, it's flooding your system with those electrons. They're bad for your body. Or if something's an oxidant, it's taking those electrons. The antioxidant helps to keep that process from occurring. So you don't want all those electrons building up in your, in your body. It's not good for you. So if we take things that are antioxidants, like blueberries, dark chocolate, and we're looking here at chlorophyll, things like that help your body to help it through that process of that electron those electrons floating around it protects your cells from that oxidative damage it's eliminating what we just talked about those free radicals right oxidation stealing those electrons chlorophyll is going to reduce the ability of those free radicals to damage your cells which in turn reduces the appearance of aging gives you a more youthful appearance we looked at cancer treatments right what what it does is it binds to potential carcinogens carcinogen just means cancer causing Car something's carcinogenic it's cancer causing and it inhibits their ability to attack healthy cells so you have all of this cancer cells that are occurring right those are unhealthy and so it's going to inhibit the ability of those cells to attack your other cells and make them cancerous it's an anti-inflammatory so those green leaves help to reduce swelling and redness in muscle tissue and joints um, it's rich in magnesium magnesium is very good for that kind of thing you can you can rub it on topically you can take it orally um, it helps the body reduce inflammation of your joints around your bones um, it can also inhibit the growth of this candida albicans, which is a fungus that grows in your body. It causes infections like thrush. If you ever see a little baby and their tongue gets real white and has that milky stuff, that's thrush. It's just a, it's a, a, a fungal infection of the mouth. And so, you know, you have to give, uh, put stuff on the baby's tongue. But chlorophyll will inhibit that. We've talked about how it boosts our red blood cell health. RBCs, red blood cells, uh, and incorporating it into our diet, and this is how we need to do it, to eat those things I, I mentioned, leafy greens, chard, spinach, romaine, mustard greens. All of those things are very healthy for you, and, they'll, and if you get that chlorophyll into your body, it helps you just as much as it helps the, the tree. It's kind of you know like a process where one helps the other. So we can either choose to eat them raw or cooked vegetables, or you can take a chlorophyll supplement. And what I wanted to do in this lesson was to give you kind of two looks at chlorophyll. We looked at it in the trees and what it does for the trees and when it loses it, what happens to the trees? They're gonna change color because the accessory pigments come in. And I also wanted to look at how does chlorophyll help a human? So if you look at all of these things together, we kind of get more of a well-rounded look at um, chlorophyll, which is really an amazing molecule. Thanks, Ms. Sinisi. All right, well, that wraps up everything for us here today on Education Station. We want to thank everyone who shared their awesome lessons, and we want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Education Station.